The title of my talk, as you can see, is In Praise of Failure, or If at First You Don't Succeed, Fail, Fail Again. Now, I hope that's uh, kind of a provocative title. That was my intention. But I want to start with a, a, a very clear statement of what it is that I'm trying to establish and what it is that I'm not trying to establish. So let's start with what I'm not trying to establish. I am not saying here today that failure is always a good thing. I am also not saying that success is always a bad thing. I think that was, would be way too simplistic. What I am wanting to do, though, is challenge what I think is the equally simplistic idea that success is always a good thing and that failure is always a bad thing. I think that uh, it's a, the world we live in is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, it's certainly the case that success makes us feel better about ourselves. Uh, but like Friedrich Nietzsche said, not everything that makes us feel good, not everything that makes us feel better, is good for us. And conversely to that, not everything that makes us feel worse is bad for us. So. When you, I think when I look at the culture that we live in, it seems like we have a, a crippling, almost pathological fear of failure. Uh, when we commit ourselves to a project only to have those ambitions thwarted, uh, we end up feeling pathetic. We end up feeling inadequate. Uh, it, it seems like uh, it's a condemnation not simply of our actions and of our efforts, but also of our inner self. Um, and it, it gets to the point where you sort of start to feel, is, you know, is there anything at all that we fear more than failure. Um, I thought about death, perhaps, but then I realized, you know, there's a certain number of people who kill themselves every single year because they are afraid of being seen as failures. It really seems like some people out there would rather die a success than live as a failure. And I think this, this attitude is very, very uh, uh, unhealthy. I think it leads to unrealistic expectations. Uh, it distorts our priorities, and it makes us grossly unsatisfied with our lives. And I believe this fear of failure is inexorably entwined with our adoration of success. We, we, we worship success. We, it's, it's, it, we're told it's the summum bonum, the best thing in life. And when you succeed, everything just comes up roses. Um, and so when we don't succeed, we end up feeling really terrible. And we suffer, and we suffer needlessly because of this. Uh, so I think there is a, an antidote to this toxic worship of success that we have. And that antidote is embracing and loving the very idea of our own failure. Um, that's, uh, uh, I realize it's kind of a, 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 an unorthodox position, but I, I really think that failure, rather than being a source of shame, instead is a profound opportunity. Um, it gives us a chance to learn something about ourselves, which we wouldn't learn otherwise. And, and no matter what it is that we learn, we end up being better off than we were before, and frequently, better off than we would have been had we succeeded. Um, and I, I suspect that you're kind of skeptical of this, uh, that uh, you, know, you, you think that I don't really mean what I'm saying. I'm being, I'm being playfully ironic or iconoclastic, but I, 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 don't, I don't really mean that failure can be a good thing, do I? Um, I assure you I do. And to try to persuade you that I'm right in this, um, I want to use the tools of my trade, which are philosophy. And so I want to ask one of the big questions that philosophers have been asking since the, the, the days of yore. Uh, what is the good life? It's one of the big questions in philosophy. And I want to give an answer to that question from uh, none other than the governor of your state. Uh, that is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and one of his erstwhile in, uh, incarnations. So, and of course, there it goes. Hang on. There we are. Okay. And we have no audio. Crush your enemies. See them driven before you. And they hear the lamentation of the women. That is good. That is good. Okay, what you, what you missed there was the Mongol general asking Conan what is good in life. And his response was to crush your enemies, uh, to see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of the women. And, and, and much, much applause. So there's, there's one vision of the good life. Now, of course, the character of Conan and Arnold Schwarzenegger are both very successful men. One becomes king, one becomes governor. Um, but the, that line is actually poached from someone else entirely, uh, someone who's quite probably the most successful man in all of history, Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan's actual line uh, was the following. The greatest pleasure is to vanquish your enemies, to chase them before you, to rob them of their wealth, to see those dear to them bathed in tears, to ride off on their horses and clasp to your bosom their wives and daughters. Um, so on this, on this final point right there, um, an interesting note, in a 2003 genetic survey found that about 8% of the men in Central Asia, somewhere in the ballpark of 31 million men, are genetically descended from Genghis Khan. And that's to say nothing of the, his female descendants. Um, so 
you know, but on that last point, at least, it seems quite clear. Genghis Khan lived a pretty successful life. He obviously wrote off with an awful lot of other people's wives and daughters. So uh, Genghis Khan really was quite the pimp. Um, so <laughs> you, you, you got to give, give, give him respect for that, at least, if nothing else. Um, now, on his own standards, Genghis Khan was a big success. But it's not just his own standards, I think. I think on virtually any standard that you can imagine, Genghis Khan is a huge success. Um, so just take a quick look at some of his accomplishments. Uh, he conquered over 78 kingdoms in the space of 20 years. That's almost four kingdoms a year, okay? Um, he had a personal army of over 140,000 men. He was, founded the single largest empire in history. Uh, he was the most powerful human being on the planet during his lifetime. And he died doing what he loved, bathing in the blood of his enemies. So, you know, if, if, if we could say half as much about anyone else who was alive today, I think we would uh, all acknowledge that such a person was, without a doubt, a huge success. But nonetheless, when we think about people who we admire, people who we look up to, people who we want our children to emulate, I don't think Genghis Khan is on this list. And for very good reason, because despite being a huge success, um, he's really a horrible person. I and mean, he, uh, he slaughtered children, he destroyed whole civilizations, and the number of women that he raped is outstripped only by the number of men that he murdered, including, by the way, some members of his own family. So we don't really think of Genghis Khan as an admirable person, even though the fact that he is, he is a very successful person. Okay, so what's the point of all this? The, the point, this is all by way of saying that being a success does not mean that you are a good person. Now, that might seem obvious when you hear me say it, but if you look at the way we behave in this society, it seems like we haven't really internalized this message at all. Um, and I think the reason why we haven't internalized it is precisely because of that blinding obsession with, uh, with success that we have. Um, it seems like we value success more than we value even being a marginally decent human being. And if you have any doubt about that, uh, open up any newspaper anywhere in the world and count the number of stories they have about rock gods and movie stars and sports icons and contrast that with the number of stories that are out there about good Samaritans and moral saints. And I, th I think you'll see precisely where our, where our priorities lie. Now, the response to that I suspect that you were thinking is, okay, well sure, success doesn't make you a good person necessarily, but at the same time, it's not like failure makes you a good person, right? Well, actually, that's precisely what I want to contend. That's, that's the first point of five points that I want to make here today. Failure can, in fact, make you a better person. Not in all respects, of course, but in at least one respect, one very, very important respect. Failure humbles us. It reminds us of our limitations. It deflates our pretensions, while at the same time giving us guidance for what we need to do to improve and become better people. But of course, no matter how much we improve, we, we, we never become immune to failure. So what, one of the greatest things that failure can teach us about ourselves is to, to learn how to be comfortable with our imperfect selves, to not have to worry about the fact that we are not perfect, to accept that, to accept our own limitations. It's a remarkably difficult thing for a lot of people to learn, and it's a hard lesson that people frequently learn through failure. Um, one of the points of Socrates' philosophy was the statement that wisest is he who knows he knows nothing. Now, how many times do you think Socrates had to fail trying to find an answer to a question before he came across that idea? Failure makes great philosophers. It makes great scientists. It makes great artists. It makes great human beings. So some of you might be thinking that I am being critical here of ambition that we should, you know, we're, we're destined to fail, so why bother trying? Um, that's not what I'm claiming at all. I think ambition is great. Ambition is wonderful. I think we should all cultivate our ambition. Um, I, because after all, what I'm trying to say here is that failure is good for us. And if we never try, then we never fail. Like, like Homer Simpson says, trying is the first step towards failure. Um, but rather than being a reason not to try, I think that's all the more reason to try. Um, if we never try, we, we, we never fail, and that means we never learn the lessons that failure has to teach us. So well, a quick example of so someone who I think who has really learned the lessons of failure is uh, Oscar Hammerstein, of Rodgers and Hammerstein, the composer. Uh, after South Pacific became a huge hit, he took out an ad in Variety, the, uh, the, the Hollywood trade paper. Uh, and, you know, when people have big hits, it's common for them to take out ads. They list all their successes saying, hey, aren't I great, aren't I the big man, and so forth. But rather than listing successes, Hammerstein listed a dozen of his failures. And he punctuated the ad with the line, I've, I, I did it before, I can do it again. 
Now, there's a man who really understands the value of failing. So I think a lot more people could learn and benefit in their lives if they could internalize this, the value of failure. Uh, think, for example, about you know, all the people who have lost their jobs in the recent economic crisis. Um, now, obviously, uh, being fired is one of the most painful forms of failure. And I'm really not trying to marginalize anyone who's been through that because it is a, a, a very difficult thing. But at the same time, I think most of that pain comes not so much from the loss of income or even the loss of benefits, but rather from the blow that it gives to our self-esteem. We feel inadequate. We feel like a failure when we get fired. Um, and it's worth noting that uh, this has not always been the case. This attitude is a decidedly fairly recent development. Up until the 18th century, the word failure was pretty much always reserved for businesses and enterprises. And even when it started to be applied to individuals, it was something that someone did or something that, some, that happened to someone. It wasn't something that someone is. It wasn't a, a mark of personal identity that you were a failure. Um, it was uh, really the, the 19th century and 19th century America where ideas like meritocracy and social Darwinism started to come to the forefront, uh, that that started to shift. And suddenly we started thinking of failure as something that people were rather than something that people did. So the second point I want to make then is that failure can be a profound source of insight. And I want to illustrate this by telling a story about a man who got fired. Uh, he was a Massachusetts civil servant. Um, and he thought he was relatively good at his job. He thought he was doing okay. Um, and then one day he was rather unceremoniously fired. And like many people, he took this very, very personally. It hurt him a lot. Um, he had a family to support, a wife and two young daughters. Um, and he had no idea what he was going to do. Um, and he felt awful. He spent the whole day walking around the streets of Salem trying to figure out how he could break this news to his wife. And so finally, when he came home late at night, his, his wife was, was very distressed because he was coming home later than usual. She didn't know what was wrong. So head hung low and in sh with shame, he said, honey, I was fired today. And her reaction was utter joy. She said, that's wonderful. You always hated that job anyway. Now you can finally write that novel you've been talking about all these years. And that's exactly what he did. The man was Nathaniel Hawthorne. And the novel was A Scarlet Letter. Now, it's very easy, I think, to miss the point of this story. Champions of success see this as a story uh, that shows how one failure can lead to greater success. And, and I think if you, if, you, if you look around, you see a, a lot of people m make this sort of statement. Uh, so Shiro Honda, uh, the founder of the Honda Motor Company, once said, success is 99% failure. Michael Jordan took out an ad a couple of years back in which he proclaimed all these different failures, including the fact that he got cut from his high school basketball team. And he closed the ad by saying, I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Uh, just last year, uh, J.K. Rowling gave the commencement address at Harvard talking about how much she had failed, and you know, look at me now. Now, I, there's, I think there is some practical wisdom in stories like this, because in, in, indeed, sometimes this is how success happens. Um, and the Scarlet Letter was a huge success, even uh, you know, uh, in Nathaniel Hawthorne's own life. But if we, if we think, if we take, that's what we take the moral of that story to be. I really think we miss what's most important. Um, that kind of thinking about success and failure is a way to anesthetize our own pain at failure and thereby not really learn the, 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 the lessons that we have from failure. The value of failure is not simply a step, stepping stone to success. It's not simply something that prepares us or gets us ready uh, or makes us better at succeeding. Um, I think these are shallow comforts that we tell ourselves when we fail. Because really, there's only a small number of J.K. Rowling's and Sociero Honda's and Michael Jordan's in the world. And the fact of the matter is most of us are not going to be them. Most of us are going to fail and then fail again. So the real point of this story, I think, is Sophia Hawthorne. She loved her husband and had complete and total trust in him, so much so that, that, that horrible news that most people would have taken as, as a, a, a real serious problem and a real serious source of fear and anxiety. She didn't even blanch. She looked him right back in the eye and said, go write that novel. Now, long before he actually finished the Scarlet Letter or published it or it became a, a literary success, in that moment right there, Nathaniel Hawthorne had something that I think most of us never get to experience. And truly successful people almost definitely never get to experience it. They get a genuine moment of truth, a genuine moment where they get to see inside themselves and inside the people that they love, and they get to prove themselves. You can't manufacture something like that. You can't purchase it. You can't deserve it. 
Success cannot afford us this kind of moment of insight. Only failure can. So I want to turn now to a third point, the idea that failure can be its own reward. Um, so rather than talking about maybe sort of uh, commercial success or, 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 or financial success, or career success, um, let's make this one a little bit more about existentialist success, perhaps anticipating a little bit my colleague Will Smith's uh, talk here in, in a little bit. Um, hopefully uh, not too inaccurately, but uh, I suppose time will tell about that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not just that we can fail at our jobs. Some, what about when we fail at being the kind of person that we want to be? What if we fail in a way that, that compromises our values, compromises our integrity? Uh, surely that kind of failure isn't good, right? I mean, uh, uh, surely we should always hope that we succeed at, at, at being an authentic person, right? Um, no. Actually, I think that kind of failure can be good, too. Again, it isn't necessarily always, but can be good. And to, to demonstrate this, I want to uh, talk about two cases which I'm poaching from the philosopher Jonathan Bennett. Uh, the first case is Huckleberry Finn. Um, now, um, I'm assuming most of you have read the novel, um, but if you haven't, I can tell you the relevant portions here. Uh, um, Huck has uh, uh, absconded away with uh, his friend Jim, who is a slave, um, and he's starting to feel guilty about the fact that he's stolen this slave from his rightful owner, Miss Watson. Um, and he's conflicted. He doesn't know what to do. He's contemplating turning Jim in because, after all, his personal value system, his social value system, and even the, the, the laws of God themselves say, thou shalt not steal. And he's seriously concerned about his, the fate of his own soul uh, at this moment in the book. Um, he doesn't know what to do. He wrestles with it. But then finally he decides, you know what? I'm going to violate my own principles. And he says, all right then, I'll go to hell. And it's this incredibly profound moment. Huck compromises his own values. He betrays his own principles. And isn't it a great thing? I mean, isn't it a wonderful thing, I mean, not only for the story, because it's a great story, but I mean, just as, as, as a basic point of sort of, you know, what we think to be the morally correct thing to do. If people with bad moral compasses continue to be authentic towards themselves, then that's a really bad thing. Now, if only we could say the same thing were true about this man. This is Heinrich Himmler. As you can probably tell from his uniform, he's a Nazi. He was one of the top Nazis. He was the, the head of the SS, the Nazi police force, and he was the main architect behind Hitler's final solution. He is personally responsible for the death of millions of human beings. But the strange thing is, is that when you look at his diaries, he actually felt conflicted about what he was doing. I mean, there was, a, there was a part of him that said, you know, I don't know if this is the right thing. I'm killing millions of innocent people. But at the same time, he also said, you know, uh, uh, this is who I am. I'm a Nazi. I'm committed to this. This is the right thing. Uh, his, his, again, his personal values, his social values, and he thought even the values of God himself committed him to this action. But unlike Huckleberry Finn, Himmler did not choose to compromise his own values. He stayed true to them. And millions of innocent human beings paid the price. Wouldn't it have been a fantastic thing had Himmler failed to be such an authentic Nazi? OK, so in order to sort of move into uh, the, the, the fourth point that I want to make, I've got to tell a roundabout story about uh, one of the, the greatest failures in the history of philosophy. Uh, it's a guy by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer. Now, Schopenhauer was a 19th century German philosopher, um, and one of the things he's most famous for is he's one of the first people to fuse uh, Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy together. Um, the, the, the style of philosophy he, he engages in is called pessimism, uh, and uh, important to his whole, whole philosophy is the first noble truth of Buddhism, which says, life is suffering. So that gives you a little flavor right there of the kind of disposition he had. Now, despite the fact that Schopenhauer himself was not a very happy person, um, and also was quite frankly, uh, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, a, a fairly miserable failure. He actually teaches us something really important, namely that success will not make you happy. So in order to see how this works, I've got to tell a little story about Schopenhauer's arch nemesis, a guy, a guy by the name of Georg Hegel. Uh, Hegel was the most famous, most successful philosopher in Germany at the time. Huge, ridiculous. Now, everyone in Germany loved this guy except for Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer thought he was uh, uh, an imposter. He thought he was a fraud. He wanted to, to, to expose him as such. He wrote all sorts of horrible things about him his writings. One, one footnote, he says, uh, future generations must forgive me for making reference to this fellow Hegel, uh, a man I'm sure none of you have ever heard of before. Uh, so quite confident about who was going to go down in history there. Um, so, but despite the fact that he, uh, uh, he was a failure, he also had some important connections. His family was rich, and those connections uh, managed to land him a teaching job at the University of Berlin, the same place where Hegel taught. Um, and so uh, Schopenhauer decided to schedule his lectures at the exact same time as Hegel's lectures. 
Okay? This is an incredibly ballsy thing to do because Hegel's lectures filled the room. Over 300 students showed up to Hegel's lecture. Schopenhauer had zero. Not a single one. Empty room. Now, a lesser man probably would have felt rebuked by that. Lesser man would have thought, okay, I'm going about this wrong. Lesser man would have rethought his strategy. Not Schopenhauer. In an act of sheer volumetric defiance, Schopenhauer gave the lecture to an empty classroom. <laughs> now, there is a man who truly knows how to fail. If you're going to go down, go down swinging. He was fired the next year, by the way. Uh, and he spent the rest of his life struggling uh, as an obscure philosopher, uh, getting virtually no recognition at all. It wasn't really until the very end of his life and then after his death that he finally uh, arose to prominence. Uh, so the, the, the beauty of Schopenhauer's failure is that it made him one of the most distinctive thinkers in history. Had Schopenhauer been an outrageous success from the beginning, the character of his thought would have been very, very different and quite frankly probably a lot less interesting. Probably would have been boring. What makes Schopenhauer such an incredible person to read and to think about is that despite this incredibly dark, sardonic attitude that he takes at every single step of the way, uh, reading him is not only very, very liberating and empowering, it's also ridiculously funny. It makes you laugh at how preposterous and absurd life is. Uh, so, you know, for example, here's a nice graphic that I think always illustrates Schopenhauer's point rather well. Pessimism. Every dark cloud has a silver lining but lightning kills hundreds of people each year who are trying to find it. That's about as Schopenhauerian as a sentiment as I know how to, how to muster. I, think, I don't think Schopenhauer could have said it himself uh, better. So the takeaway, I think, of what it is that, that, that Schopenhauer is, is trying to, to, uh, t has to teach us is that failure made him an amazing human being. Failure made him uh, stand out from a bunch of ordinary, bland, banal thinkers that populated the 19th century, 19th century German landscape uh, and made him someone who will, will echo throughout history. Now you might say, well, isn't that a form of success? And well, you're being too smart for your own good if you do so say that. Okay, um, so Schopenhauer did more than just diagnose the misery at the heart of the human condition. He did more than just embody the misery. He gave us tools to cope with it. He gave us advice on how to respond to all the suffering that we see everywhere in life, including, of course, failure. So, yeah, you failed, but so does everyone. Everyone fails. So, you know, every time you see, like, you know, that, the, the guy that just landed your dream job or, 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 or who just got that promotion that you were gunning for or, or, or the rock star with a, with a supermodel actress, it's easy to start feeling overcome with feelings of envy and self-pity. What corrosive emotions these are. Schopenhauer is giving us a way to let those go because you recognize every time you see one of these people, every single one of them will fail at something profound in their life at some point. They may be on top of the world now, but before long they will move on to something else. This is what Schopenhauer says. You can never be truly satisfied for a long period of time in your life because any time you get what you want, you're happy for a short while and then you move on to wanting something else. And next time around, you might not get what you want. But even if you do, you really won't be happy with it. You won't ever be happy with it. So recognize that these people are all failures, just like you. And so that's, that, 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 that's the fourth point. In failure, there is solidarity. We are all unified by our failures. So, so think about those people's failures, not, not to revel in the fact that they're, they're inevitable downfall, some sort of schadenfreutastic kind of uh, uh, loathing, but rather to see in them a kindred spirit to see in them a fellow failure. And that's really just the, the, the fantastic, potent cure for envy and self-pity, is, is, is the recognition that we're all failing together. Um, J.M. Berry, the author of Peter Pan, once said, we are all failures, at least the best of us are. I think Schopenhauer would agree. When we fail, we find ourselves united with all of humanity. All right, fifth and final point. Uh, failure can make you invincible. Now, this one, I think, might sound the strangest at the outset. So uh, in order to, to introduce it, I want to turn to this fairly famous painting, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. This is uh, Raphael's School of Athens. Now, when, when you, uh, when there's a lot of people here, obviously, but when you first look at it, you know, again, the, 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 the lines obviously draw your attention to these two figures right here in the center. That's Plato and Aristotle, the founders of Western philosophy, um, obviously sort of the most prominent intellects uh, on the stage here. But after your eyes settle on them, where do they go next? 
you know, we'll, we'll start to trace your eyes, see where your eyes naturally are inclined to go next. I think the large amount of negative space around this figure right here is, it, it, uh, makes us go right to him next. So who is this person that Raphael seems to place second only to Plato and Aristotle themselves? Uh, well, this is Diogenes of Sinope. And Diogenes is probably the greatest failure in the history of philosophy. Uh, he is uh, a bum, quite literally. Uh, he, he lived in a garbage can. Uh, he, he, he survived by uh, digging, eating other people's trash and, and begging other people for change. Uh, so if you saw this guy in the street, you wouldn't hesitate. You'd say, yeah, that guy's a total failure. You know, that would be the obvious and immediate judgment you'd see. Um, he was notorious for any number of weird things, including masturbating in public. Um, couldn't quite find an image of that one. So. <laughs> um, but he was arrested and uh, brought before the judge. The judge asked him what he had to say for himself, and his response was, if only I could satisfy my hunger by vigorously rubbing my belly. Um, he was also known to beg money from statues. And when asked why he did this, he said, I'm getting used to rejection. <laughs> and apparently he must have gotten really good at rejection because he became fearless in his pursuit of rejection. Um, and the, uh, uh, the best illustration of this is probably one of his most famous stories. It's when Alexander the Great was passing through Corinth and he heard about this wise philosopher Diogenes and he wanted to go see him. Uh, so when he found him, he found him rooting around in a garbage bin, garbage bin um, and he was puzzled. Why is this wise philosopher digging around in trash? You know, this, is, this is something that, you know, I'm not even sure Alexander the Great had ever even seen garbage before, much less a man in a garbage bin. So he, he asked him, what are you doing? No, no preface, no introduction. Diogenes looks, up, right, looks right up at him and says, I'm looking for the bones of your father, but I cannot distinguish them from the bones of his slaves. This is Alexander the Great, okay? He's the most powerful man in the world. All he has to do is snap his fingers and Diogenes would be tortured for the rest of his life and even uttering his name would have been a crime punishable by death. Think about this. The point is that you cannot hurt Diogenes. Diogenes is invincible. He has failed so spectacularly that there's absolutely nothing you can do that will take anything from him. Pretty potent statement. Now, um, Diog Alexander the Great had some pretty serious daddy issues, so, I, so it, it's kind of surprising that he didn't snap his fingers in such a way. Um, but thankfully, uh, possibly due to the influence of his tutor Aristotle, Alexander was something of a contemplative man who enjoyed philosophy. So rather than torturing, he chose to sat down in the gutter and talk about philosophy with Diogenes. And they talked for several hours. And as, as, the, as, as the day wore on, um, Alexander stood up to go. Um, and he turned to Diogenes. And he said, you know, you have impressed me so much. I will give you whatever your heart desires. Just name it. Um, it's the brass ring. Diogenes can, can say anything. Money, land, power, women. It's all his. Diogenes is perilously close to success at this moment, OK? <laughs> and what he says is, would you mind stepping aside? You're standing in my sunlight. <laughs> That's all he needs. Uh, just as he's immune to threats and punishment and torture, Diogenes was impervious to temptation. There is absolutely nothing that he needs. Walking away, Alexander turned to his court retainer and said, were I not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. That's the power of philosophy right there, okay? The most successful man in the world is envying a homeless guy. Next time someone tells you that philosophy is useless, tell them about Diogenes. Okay, so uh, in sum, whether we're talking about Genghis Khan and how failure can make you a better person, or Nathaniel and Sophia Hawthorne about how failure can be a source of insight, or Huck Finn and Heinrich Himmler about how failure can be its own reward, or Arthur Schopenhauer and how we are, have, can have solidarity through failure, or whether we're talking about Diogenes and how we can be freed and liberated and made invincible through failure, I hope you see that there's a lot of value to failure. We should not view it as something that's necessarily negative or evil or wrong, and we should not be afraid to do it. Uh, so, a couple parting thoughts here. A uh, quote from uh, another self-proclaimed failure, this, the, the playwright Samuel Beckett. Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. I hope my talk today has given you a better sense of the value of failure and how, given you at least some insight into how you personally can fail better. But of course, if I have not succeeded in that ambition, well, it, it just might be for the best.